uh, include. This week's Bible sections include the last segment that goes into the fall, fallout after Jesus fed those 5,000 men and probably another five, six, seven thousand 7,000 women and children and how they hunted Jesus down, found in the next day, and then he tried to talk them down. And they weren't buying what he was selling. All they wanted was more security in life. They wanted to be sure they did not need to worry about starvation or anything else. So remember, at the beginning of this Bible section, our, normally our translations say, I am the bread of life. What you want to remember is, first of all, that I am part is Jesus using that name that God used in the Old Testament Bible to talk, talk about himself, the I am, which is the same as the word Yahweh. It's where that word comes from. And then he's not just talking about bread. He's talking about how he's the only food that people can ever get that's going to ensure them immortality, that they're never going to die. I think Jesus is doing what he has always done in the past with miracles, uh, with, uh, with uh, parables. He, he tells parables he knows a good percentage of his people are not going to understand. They're not going to get it at all. And he says that's because they've closed their minds to understanding the truth. God opens the minds of people and, and helps them get it. So keep that in mind as you look at this section. You'll see the Bible readings as I'm going to give them to you. They're on the website. If you want to follow along with your own hard copy Bible or online Bible, you'll probably find that really helpful to compare the two things. And it might help you concentrate better and it, it might stick in your head a little longer. So we're going to start with the section from the Gospels for today. That's the Gospel of John. So it's John 6. And it starts in verse 51. It's Jesus talking. I am the food person. I came from heaven. Eat this food and you're going to have life that never ends, that goes on forever. My body is the food I'm giving up to bring life to all the people in the world. Now, he, he is not talking about the Lord's Supper. This is very important for you to understand. He won't give the Lord's Supper until the night before his death, the night before his execution, the night he's arrested by the Jewish national leaders. So they don't know anything about communion. He's saying, the life I live it entitles you to God's holiness. The damnation death I die is what rescues you from feeling what you deserve. Verse 52. Jesus' Jewish enemies started quarreling with each other. They said, how can this guy serve up his body as a meal? Jesus told them, I guarantee none of you are going to survive unless you feed on the Son of Man's body and drink his blood. People who feed on my body and drink in my blood get instant life that never ends. It goes on forever. My body gives real nutrition. My blood is really nutritional. People who feed on my body and drink in my blood live inside of me. That's the spandex Jesus costume. And I live inside of them. That's a fancy way of talking about Christian living. My father, who decides who lives and who dies, 
sent me. I live because of my father. So people who feed on me are going to live because of me. This is the food. And here again, he's probably pointing right at himself. He's tapping himself on the chest and going, this is the food that came from heaven. It's not like the food your ancestors ate. They eventually died. People who eat this food, again, he's pointing at himself, are going to live forever. This kind of talk is one of the reasons why one famous Christian scholar said, either Jesus is incredibly deluded and insane, totally out of his mind, or the things he says are really true, and he is God at the same time, 100% that he is 100% human too, and he's the only person who can rescue people who are intent on sinning from what they deserve in this life and the afterlife. Verse 59. Jesus gave this talk while explaining the Bible in Capernaum's community center. A lot of the people Jesus trained heard this all. They said, he's gone too far. We don't want to listen anymore. Jesus was aware. Former students were having a hard time with this. So Jesus asked, did what I say make you want to give up on me? What if you see the Son of Man go to heaven where he was before? Only God's spirit gives people life that never ends. Sinful minds and bodies do nothing to help. The things I've told you bring God's life-giving spirit. Some of you refuse to depend on me. In other words, when people believe the Bible's claiming, and Jesus is saying, when people believe that's due entirely to God's intervention. And when people reject the news about Jesus, that's due entirely to their own blind inability to value what God says is of inestimable value. 60, verse 64, some of you refuse to depend on me. Jesus knew from the start which ones wouldn't believe and which one would turn on him and give him up to his enemies. So he added, that's why I told you people, no one can come to me unless the Father makes them want to come. Jesus' speech made a lot of people learning from him, go back to the lives they had had before they studied under Jesus. So Jesus asked the 12 apostles, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, there isn't anyone else like you. Only what you say gives people life that never ends. It goes on forever. Besides, we believe, we are sure you're the special one God picked to rescue humanity. You're that Messiah person that the Old Testament talked about. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about Jesus' actual words in the New Testament or whether we're talking about stuff that the Bible teaches in the Old Testament. It's still God's word. It's Jesus' words. And it is the only thing that can give people life, uh, instant life that never ends. It goes on forever. That takes us to today's second Bible section. From the book of Deuteronomy, you may often have wondered and what does this Deuteronomy word mean? I mean, it's such a weird word. The, the nomi part at the end is the word for law or God's instructions to people. He gave them through Moses. And Deutero is the word for second. God had to give 
the message about his personal instructions for the nationality that he selected. He did that originally with Moses just a couple months out of Egypt on Mount Sinai. All the people then heard it, but then Moses stayed around for 40 years, and the people stayed around too in the desert, but they didn't survive. Everyone uh, that was an adult, all the males who were adults did not survive the 40 years. God said, they all have to die in the desert. I'm taking the next generation into the Holy Land, not the original folks. And so all the ones who were minors, underage, and all the ones who had not been born were the ones that Moses ends up talking to before his own death, before the people enter the promised land. So he had to give the same message he'd given 40 years earlier to this new generation of people. And that's what Deuteronomy is about. So those are the people Moses is talking to here in this uh, section. Israel, listen to the teachings and rules I'm about to give you. Obey them so you can survive and enter and take over the land Yahweh, God of your ancestors, is giving you. Never add a thing to what I command or take a thing away from it. Just obey Yahweh, your God's commands, I'm giving you. Obey these teachings carefully. This will show people in other nations your wisdom and insight. They'll hear about all these teachings, and they'll say, that Israel nation is great. They have great wisdom and insight. No other nation has what we have. Their gods are not intimate with them the way Yahweh our God is. He's always ready to listen to us. No other nation, no matter how great, has teachings and rules like the ones I'm giving you today. What he means is not that the moral code that... God told Jewish people about what's right and what's wrong was so great because everybody's God built that into everybody's consciences. So we're partly aware of that as human beings. What it means when it says no other nation has teachings and rules like the ones I'm giving you today means no other God had ever given any kind of rescue plan that, that, blanketed all humanity, every single person, like the God of the Bible. And it involved him taking the place of losers, of sinners, of people who have insulted him and disregarded him. All the other gods basically don't give a, don't give a rip at all, or just decide to come down like a ton of bricks on whoever dares to step over the line. Verse 9, just make sure you stay alert. Keep close watch over yourselves. Don't forget what you've seen. Don't let it ever fade from your memory. Teach your children and grandchildren this. And the this he's talking about is the same stuff that we look at Every time we check out the Bible, every time we get together like this, the centerpiece is always God the Son, Jesus, and what he did to rescue us. That's the plan that God the Father came up with and empowered his Son to do. This is the plan that the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, um, brought to light for us and lassoed us into his family of believers. The final section for today is from the Romans book in the New Testament. One of those books that turn out to be letters that God breathed into the men. He had Jesus select and train to be his worldwide missionaries and to be his Bible writers. And so this is from the letter to the Romans, and we're starting in chapter 9. 
So God explains, non-Jewish people who weren't trying to earn God's approval, they weren't trying to earn God's approval. They got it anyway. His approval comes as we depend on what Jesus did in our place. Israel's people tried to win God's approval by doing what God's instructions demanded. That's what Israel's people tried to do, win God's approval. Instead, they failed. Why? Verse 32, they didn't rely on what Jesus had done in their places to get God's approval. They relied on their own efforts. They stumbled over the rock that trips people up. God says in the Bible, I put a rock in Jerusalem that people trip over. It's a large rock that people don't take seriously. He will never disappoint anyone who depends on him. That rock is a person. And in the Old Testament, it mentioned this sort of thing at least three or four times. So this is a real famous Old Testament Bible snippet that's referring to Jesus. It goes on, brothers and sisters, the thing I want most for Jews is for them to be saved from God's punishment. I really pray for that. I'll tell you this. They are deeply religious, but they focus on the wrong thing. They don't grasp how to get the goodness only God can give. So they set up their own way to get it. They disregard the only way God gives away his goodness. Messiah is the way we got God's goodness that God's teachings explain. Everyone who depends on the goodness Jesus earned for us has what he promised. I don't know if you remember, you're not maybe as old as me, but way back in the day when Saturday Night Live was funny, they would have a regular segment where a cat would drive the car. This was called Toonces, the cat who could drive a car. The co-host or stars of Saturday Night Live would pretend to be some family members who had a cat who could drive the family car and he drove around and everybody thought this was the cutest thing in the world until at the end, the cat would always drive the car like off of a cliff or something. There would be a just a horrendous crash because Toons is, is a cat. He can't really drive the car. And of course, this segment would repeat with different actors and stuff over the course of the year because people never got tired of seeing how originally you got fooled into thinking the cat could drive. In the, in the end, he never could really drive. In this Bible section we just looked at, the, one of the most noticeable words in the old translations that we grew up with is righteousness. It's kind of a, one of those Bible code words. If you take the ness off the end and the O-U-S from right before that, you got the word right. Righteousness is when you're totally right in God's record book. When he's got you down for doing no wrong, you can see the definitions here. It means basically to be as holy as God himself. That is righteousness. And you saw in this Bible section how the Jewish people thought that God had stuck those rules in their Bibles, and they were the only nationality that had these Bibles, because those rules were actually obeyable. 
And so they worked hard thinking if they just kept their noses clean and followed the rules, colored within the lines, like God said, that he would award them righteous or being right all the time status. And the Bible and Jesus and the Old Testament all said nobody's going to achieve that status by anything they do. And, and then the first line of this Bible section we got for today tells us that the only way that people get it is by not depending at all on what they've done, but by, by depending on the substitute God sent. And so thinking that we're going to achieve credit for being good enough is a lost cause depending on what Jesus did. Anytime you see that word faith in the Bible, remember, it's never faith in our faith. It's always faith in what God the Son would do in the place of every human as their substitute. Faith in what Jesus did in our place. A good example of this is in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is recording for us what happened with the people of Israel once they crossed into the Holy Land. Their leader from God was Joshua. Moses, their previous leader, was dead. He'd spent 40 years as their messenger from God. And I guess you'd probably describe him as their head pastor. And the Bible tells us in Joshua 5 that the Jewish men who'd left Egypt with Moses had been circumcised. The men born later in the desert had not. These would be the people who were under the leadership of Moses. And, and you have to remember, we're talking about thousands and millions of, of people. The, the, the Bible tells us there would be like 600,000 Jewish men who made up their military forces eligible for going to war. The Bible says that those Jewish people's sons who took the places of the adults that had died out in the desert during the 40 years had not been circumcised the past 40 years. So Joshua circumcised them. Why in the world didn't they get circumcised? The buck, of course, stops on the desk of Moses. Moses was the supervisor that God had sent. And he did nothing to make sure that Jewish people had followed this rule that God had gave. I want you to remember that circumcision wasn't about doing some surgery that would be hideously painful for Jewish males. You know, they, the, the rule that God gave was eight days after you're born, after a Jewish baby boy is born, is when they have to do this surgery without anesthesia on these kids. Um, Moses didn't seem to have a thing with circumcision. It doesn't seem as though, even though he got it, he didn't have a choice. His parents did it to him when he was eight days old. Moses didn't want to follow God's rules about this. You get an interesting, a very interesting episode in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter four is right after the burning bush episode where God identifies Moses as the person he wants to go to Egypt from the desert here and tell the emperor of Egypt to let the Jewish people uh, liberate them, let them emigrate from Egypt into the Holy Land. Well, then you get Exodus chapter four that says along their way to Egypt, Moses and his family stopped for the night and Yahweh met Moses and tried to kill him. Moses' wife took a flint knife and circumcised her son. And so Yahweh spared Moses' life. Think about this for a second. We can divide Moses' 120 total years of life here into three equal parts. The first 40 years of Moses' life, 
he ends up as prince of Egypt and lives a, a pretty nice life. He gets the best education and everything else that a royal family member would get. The next 40 years is after Moses kills a Jewish slave driver. And then he has to run for his life into the desert. And he hides out there as a shepherd for 40 years. Right away at the beginning of that 40-year period, when Moses is, say, let's say 41, then he starts working for his future father-in-law and marries one of his future father-in-law's daughters. It talks about this son. This son was probably born a few years or so after this marriage. And so when it says that Moses' wife took a flint knife and circumcised her son, we're not talking about an eight-day-old baby. We're talking about a full-grown adult. And Mrs. Moses had to do this circumcision because Moses wouldn't do it. Circumcision started 500 years earlier in the book of Genesis with Abraham. In chapter 17, Abraham, God first told Abraham to do this circumcision on everybody that he employed and was in his uh, family that was a male. And so ever since then, Jewish people have been doing this circumcision. Circumcision was not about you showing your commitment to God by doing the most painful thing physical thing possible you could to boy babies. This wasn't about what people were doing for God. This circumcision act and its subsequent scar were always a reminder to Jewish people about the guarantee that God was going to send his son through the normal reproductive process of Jewish people. And that's why surgery came to that Jewish male body part, because God was all about showing them what he was going to do for them, not what they were going to do for him. And so this was, I guess you would say, the way that God used Jewish people to do outreach into other nationalities. Other nationalities would see this scar that Jewish people had inflicted on themselves. And they go, what in the world is wrong with you people? This was the identifying mark of Jewish people for hundreds of years until God gave the commandments. And then God made other kinds of things that identified Jewish people as well as the circumcision. And this was the way that Jewish people could then explain what God was going to do, what he had promised and said he was going to have a Jewish guy be the rescuer of all humanity's sinners. Moses hadn't taken care of this with his own son for his whole adult life up to this point. And God was sick and tired of this and was going to kill Moses. So Moses didn't do what he was supposed to do with his own family members. And then when he became the national leader for the 3 million Jewish people, he didn't do it either. He, did, he, he didn't do what God told him to make sure Jewish people did to highlight the integral part of God's rescue plan, which would, was Jesus' arrival into the family of human beings as a Jewish person. We go, why in the world wouldn't Jewish, why wouldn't Moses do this stuff? This, this seems like not that much of a difficult thing to supervise, but maybe Moses was repelled by this kind of surgery and didn't want to be party to it for some reason. I don't know, but it was enough that we, we might say, well, this is kind of a minor sin. It's not like he murdered somebody, which he had done. But God considered it such a major deal that he was going to kill Moses. He just had it with him. His tolerance, his patience for Moses was up. And no matter what Moses did, 
God was going to, to kill him. Now you got to go back, I got to go forward, I should say, 1,500 years after Moses' body gave out. Then you have Jesus up on that mountain, right? Where all of a sudden his physical appearance transforms so that he looks like the way we're going to see him one day, 100% God. And then out of nowhere appear Moses again and Elijah. And the Bible tells us that God, that, that, that Moses and Elijah talked with Jesus about what he was going to do when he went to Jerusalem to put the finishing touches on God's rescue plan for all people. You can just imagine what Moses would say to Jesus. I can't imagine how many of my sins, how much my sins are going to end up hurting you. You're going to face the damnation punishment that God wanted to give me. You're going to get that in my place. And I just want to let you know I'm eternally grateful for what you're going to do for me. We always think of Moses as such a great hero of Christian faith, but the Bible shows Moses, just like it shows everybody else, as totally full of sin and doing things that under no circumstances you could justify. Moses was a horrible sinner. And maybe just the thought of what he was going to suffer made Jesus kind of feel the same dread he felt on that night before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And God sent Moses and Elijah to remind him that everybody's life was on the line. And the encouragement that Moses and Elijah gave Jesus would be just what he needed for this important mission that God had sent him on. Way back, ancient Greeks used, had made up a kind of creature because ancient Greek people loved to sail, have adventures on the ocean where they would find new lands where people had not been before and to colonize these new lands and make them into a little bit of Greece in a foreign country. When they sail, they would run into all kinds of horrible conditions. And one of the ways that they used to explain these horrible conditions was what they called sirens, S-I-R-E-N. -S -S these sirens were mythical creatures who had the body of a beautiful woman on top and then some kind of an animal body for their lower half, maybe a fish body, like a mermaid. Some Greek people pictured them as having a bird lower body. But the reason they got the name Siren is because they would sing. And this singing of theirs would lure the sailors to come right where the ocean was at its most dangerous or come into conditions that the sailors would not be able to control. And then the boat would wreck and all the people on board, all the sailors would die. So sirens looked good at first mm -hmm. appearance, but were deadly when you got a little closer when you got to know them. This same idea is what the Bible section that we're looking at here is telling us about. What seems right to us, that if I just try to be good and do good, that ought to be enough for God. It's kind of like the siren song that has wrecked so many people, doing what comes natural, right? And so over and over again in the Bible, God had to come to people and remind them, it is not, even though this is very attractive to us, this is not the way that's going to work. It is not going to work for you to try to get God's attention by the things you give up 
or the self-sacrificing things you do for God. And when Jesus told people this sort of stuff that, you know, it wasn't what they were doing for him, but what God was going to do for them by sending Jesus. Then you saw in our first Bible reading how people bailed on him like crazy. Even people who had been listening to him and had been letting his teachings influence them. And Jesus had to even talk to the 12 guys that were closest to him to make sure that they didn't want to bail on him too. And when they committed to staying with him, he reminded them that the fact that they were recognizing his value was due entirely to what God had done inside of them helping them see the lie about our own goodness and not listen to the siren song that Satan wants us to think about. And, and so this is one of the things we have to remember is that the things that are most important in the Bible are things that are not logical that are not, that do not make sense rationally, that human beings are not going to be able to understand right away and go, oh yeah, of course. I mean, think about it. We've talked about this. The one plus one plus one equals one God. That does not make any sense. The Bible teaches that, and it's going to go against the siren song of our own common sense that says everything, the only things we, we should believe are things that make sense to us. Same thing with the, the plan that God came up with to rescue people. Having Jesus be 100% God and 100% human at the first time, we go, well, that's ridiculous. You can't be God and have a birthday. You can't be God and have a death certificate. And so it doesn't make sense. A lot of people just blow this up. Even the way that God came up with to rescue people. We would think that has to involve some sort of contribution on our part to finalize the deal. The Bible says it involves no contribution on your part. Just let God do all the heavy lifting. You are not up to the task. And then when we ask the question that this Bible section asks, why some people and why not others? It's easy for us to find something in people that God used to decide this. We don't like to hear that the way that God used to decide who deserves to hear his news, become part of his family and be safe forever has nothing to do with anything about us. It has everything to do with him giving us the opposite of what we deserve. None of this is satisfying to us. But God continues to use his supernatural Bible message to supernaturally get into our heads, help us depend on Jesus, and not listen to the siren song of what seems right and that everybody would agree with is right, to help us believe the opposite of what comes natural, depend on Jesus and his control over our life how he's blessing us even when things don't make sense and aren't going right and there's a lot of pain and suffering and that he tells us everything in the end is going to, all the painful stuff is just going to be temporary and he guarantees us a new life and after this life, life, where we are going to see his hand in everything and we're going to acknowledge he made all the right moves. And let's close with a prayer. Father, we've looked at a lot of things today in your Bible section, in these three Bible sections we went through. And in each case, we see how people naturally do not want to pay attention to stuff you say. What you say is not attractive to us at first glance. And we just want to disregard it. Thank you for clearing our minds and giving us the ability to notice and care about what you did in our place. We're grateful for the way 
you laid out your message, the bad news about our sin, the unbelievably good news about our rescuer, and then, and then keep us part of your family of believers right up until the end. We're grateful for that. And we want to take as many others with us as possible. Bless us with the time we have left in that mission for you out of gratitude for Jesus and his life in our place. Amen. So now receive and believe the blessing of the Lord himself to you comes courtesy of what God the Son did in our place with his lifetime achievement award that he gives us credit for earning and then his damnation death sentence that where he took all the blame for every one of our sins that's why he can guarantee us that the lord is blessing us all the time and protecting us constantly too the lord is making his face shine or smile on us and he's being gracious to us the opposite of what we all deserve the lord's looking on us with his favor and he's giving us his peace so that's it on uh, this week's get together